because others of a certain generation, not anybody on the stage right now. So we're going to start with these questions. I'm going to pass the microphone, just ask the three questions, go down the side, come back up the side, go back down the side. So we're going to start with Jan. And Jan, the first question is, are you often or ever inspired by the sounds of the natural world or from real life sounds in general? Well, I was an electronic music composer for many years, and so yes, <laughs> in that sense. I was very interested in music can too. Okay. <laughs> that, that was a very short answer. I was, I was hoping it would be longer. <laughs> because my, my answer was no. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly inspired by literature and poetry, and I've written a lot of vocal music. And with the last instrumental piece that I wrote, which was, which was for piano, it was actually commissioned by a foundation in honor of a painter, an Italian painter, Emilio Vadova. And so I looked at his artwork, and I was quite inspired by that. But in the really literal sense of your question, I've tried, but somehow it doesn't, doesn't seem to work out that way. So, no. <laughs> Uh, before I address the question, I want to express my gratitude and congratulations to Lunatics at Large and their uh, guest performers tonight. What incredible music making. We are so lucky. Um, I don't like this question, by the way. Uh, life experience or nature? It seems to me like a typical Western example of artificial either or binary thinking. Uh, th these are just two of the many possibilities of what moves us to uh, compose. Um, for example, the, the poetry of uh, W.S. Merwin that I used in Labyrinths uh, uh, validates the reality of the dream world. And, uh, and perhaps that is more real even than what we choose to remember and repress about our life experiences. Uh, also, I would say uh, with a subject that composers often address, which is love, uh, uh, what I understand about love or what I believe about love is thankfully uh, not really based on my experience of it. <laughs> so, so that which we can imagine becomes another another reality which is available to us as uh, composers. Um, I I would say I, I have written um, pieces that were inspired by paintings and. Um, Georgia O'Keeffe in particular, so that counts as nature, I think. And um, I, I, as far as life experiences go, I think sometimes I've, um, I, I could say, well, I should add to the first part of the question. I've, I've also been inspired by movement, which I think is part of life, how people move. I often think of my music as, as though I'm dancing inside of my head, and since I can't dance at all, it's just a great fantasy to be able somehow I'm, feeling things physically, and that's, I guess, part of nature. Um, I also write some poetry myself, so I am very um, interested in how poetry and music work together. And the other thing I can say is that sometimes after I've written a piece, um, I realize that a life experience has affected it. For instance, I'll, I'll find a piece that was written, say, when a child was born or a father died. And I'll say, yeah, that piece is about that in some way, but it never would have, it, I never would have thought of it at the time. I don't really think that way. Uh, I love the intracranial dancing. That's, that's all. <laughs> I resonate with that. <laughs> uh, that's closer to my reality, I guess. That if I remember the question uh, uh, of uh, sounds from nature and real life, uh, the, the sounds from nature that I've actually used in music, I've, I've done them electronically also. And it's been the sounds themselves manipulated uh, uh, 
electronically, sometimes interacting with a live human, because I prefer, I prefer that sort of music. Um, but otherwise, uh, I think the elation one feels and a certain kind of breeze and, and um, the tension we can feel in, in other situations, uh, those are the real things to me, and, and the, the, the reality of the temperature in the region isn't, isn't something, or the, or the waterfalls and such. I don't literally uh, I respond to them musically. I think I, I, I think the kind of, kind of emotional response to those events are things that I do try to weave into my music. And otherwise, um, and then in, the, in a case like this, uh, tonight's piece, uh, uh, the text says so much, and it actually writes the piece for me in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, is that reality? Yeah, that's, of course, this, this text really is reality. This was something we all read in the newspaper. So uh, uh, my guess is that there's the, the more questions coming, so I'll stop. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to apologize for not having been here earlier to hear my own piece. Um, I had, as luck would have it, I had a premiere of a new piece across town at St. Peter's Church, and I tried very hard to be in two places at once, but it was it was logically impossible. Um, but and I, I I echo a lot of the thoughts that people have just said. But coincidentally, both pieces this evening. Um, reflect the question because circular motions is in fact inspired to some extent by nature, uh, uh, as the program notes uh, would indicate. Um, it didn't start out that way, it just started out to be a piece and I have to call it Maelstrom because I have, I was thinking about this snowstorm I've been in, stuck in in Rochester, but then it took on a life of its own. Uh, the other piece was actually a lament uh, for the loss of a very dear friend. Um, and I felt that I, I had to somehow deal with the, uh, it was a tragic uh, uh, ending to, to his life, and I, and I felt that I had to express my own sense of loss and grief and to some extent anger, and then and also try to resolve that in, in some emotionally uh, satisfactory way through the music. I don't do that a lot, but there are occasions when life experiences do provoke me to write certain kinds of pieces. The next question is going to be, uh, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, because the, the European version of the questions go on for a very long time. So I'm going to shorten it and say that this question is to have people react to whether or not it's important to have a personal style and what that might mean. So Richard, we're going to start with you. Well, the short answer is yes, I think it is. Um, but uh, I think that um, a, a person's style ends up being sort of the sum total of what they end up doing over the course of their their creative life. Um, but I, yes, I do. I think every every person has an individual voice, and I think that does come through uh, in the work that they do. Though it certainly isn't in the foremost of my mind when I'm when I'm writing an actual piece of music. But I hope that people can listen to my music without knowing that it was me and say, "Oh yeah, well, that, that was one of the Porpoise pieces." Yeah, I think I'm in the same boat. Uh, I, I think I don't want to write a piece that's been written particularly by somebody else. So uh, to some extent, there's a personal style I guess I'm, I'm looking for, but. Uh, as, as with Richard, when you start a piece, the piece sort of takes over and it, 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 it kind of dictates what you need to do, I think. And I don't like to repeat myself a lot. Some of my music is just terribly, uh, lots of uh, very dense clusters and some of it's sort of modal, like this, like most of science music. Uh, I'm sure I, if somebody could point at my music and say, yes, that's a style and I'm bored with it because you're doing too many of the same things. But I'm not conscious of that. Each piece is sort of a separate thing. And um, I'm not writing it to develop a personal style, but I think it's kind of inevitable. Unless you want to write somebody else's piece, you, you end up with something that's different from everyone else, which I guess is a personal style. Is that a cop out? <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have too much to add here, except that um, I think we step outside of our, of our compositions and then we we, we could, if someone asked us, what is your style, maybe we could say that we come back to certain kinds of things, you know, um, sometimes, you know, juxtaposing different things is something I like to do. Maybe someone else would call that my style, but I mean, Beethoven did that, and 
so did a lot of other people. So it's it's a it's a, it's pretty much what your ear tells you. You know, that's your style. It's what your ear you fool around with those notes and those chords, and your ear says yes, and that's it. I think. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't think I have a personal style, and I think I work to avoid that by setting myself a different problem with each composition. Uh, now, my sister, who's performed many of my chamber music works, a good friend and collaborator with Tom, by the way, uh, will say that she recognizes things. She says, you always have a pointillistic section in there somewhere, and then there's some pretty chords later on. But uh, other than that, for example, a piece could be uh, uh, the architecture of a micro and macro application of the prime number series. Uh, now the, that would, the outcome of that would certainly be different than an essay on love or on solitude. Uh, in January, I wrote two pieces. One's a tribute to the centennial of the Rite of Spring, in which I didn't compose a note of it. Everything is a quote from the Rite of Spring. I titled it Sacre Lidge. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other piece I wrote is for piano and string, string orchestra. And it's the first piece that in any way suggests that 40 years ago I had studied with Xenakis. And, uh, and again, uh, an incredibly different sonic outcome. Labyrinth tonight was actually first composed in 1980 to try to save my sister's marriage to a tenor who was losing his high notes. <laughs> <laughs> a friend asked me to say now, bachelor number two, same question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, uh, I would agree almost uh, exactly with, with Richard Brooks with your uh, very first answer that it's important for a composer to have a style, but curiously, it's not the thing that we worry about the most. I, I find myself uh, trying to find what's good, what I think what's good, um, not what's me. Um, somehow, that seems that if it's thought about too much, it, it could actually be a limiting factor. And I think, as, as Richard pointed out, when you begin, you don't have a style because you haven't written any music. And when you've written a couple of pieces, there's still not enough of a st st statistical base to determine a style. And then when you've written a lot of pieces, it's really too late to start thinking about getting a style because the music's already written. Uh, so it's, I, I think it's probably good not to worry about it too much. I was thinking of a lot of things. One about teaching and my students and mentoring, who my mentors are. But about 20 years ago, I wrote a piece called Night Chance, and that was a, a move away from electronic music for me and working with choral groups. And since then, I think. My style is a search for spirituality, working and collaborating with other, with other musicians and, and beautiful texts, but always, as I look at it all, with a spiritual base. All right, our last question is going to be, to some people I think it might be the simplest question, maybe not to everybody, um, but the last question is, a piece of music that when you heard it, a piece of music by somebody else, that changed the way you thought about music. Now, some people last night decided to just name a composer because they couldn't narrow it down to one piece. But, so we're, we'll allow that. Jay, we're gonna start with you. So Einstein on the beach, and that was a beautiful moment for me. I just admire a composer who has the courage to, to change music that way, and it's stuck with me. Many years. Well, I was going to give you some composer names, but since you specifically asked for one piece, um, I'll, that I'll uh, mention just one very recent piece uh, that uh, really got me thinking, and I thought it was a gorgeous piece, uh, Kaya Sariago's opera, La Moine de Juan. Uh, I think it's a piece that everyone should know, especially every composer. So uh, if you want one recent piece, uh, I'll throw that one out. <laughs> 
long before I started to compose uh, as a sophomore at Oberlin College in an opera literature class, I was introduced to Wozzeck. It took many years before I had the courage to um, start creating music, but uh, that, that always stuck as the critical uh, work. I'm going to throw uh, Bartok's fourth string quartet into the mix, which is probably the first piece of anything resembling atonal music that I'd ever heard in my life. And I was just uh, blown away by it. And I sort of closed my eyes and kept listening and listening and listening. And it just attacked me in a very beautiful way. Um, I, that wasn't your stole mine. Uh, or, oh, no. But I was going to name three. Yeah, no. They're old pieces, but uh, the Rite of Spring as a teenager. I was, I was and, the name that one too. Okay. <laughs> and the fourth quartet of Bartok. Three choices. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm taking two more. Uh, Bartok Court, certainly, uh, I guess also as a teenager, and uh, the Messiah Quartet for the other time. Well, I would have been on my list. <laughs> 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 you married? <laughs> oh, no. I am too. And, yeah, and the Messiah Quartet was uh, also something I didn't discover until graduate school as a cellist, actually. But uh, I've kind of lived with it ever since then, in, in teaching in uh, theory classes and exploring the piece more deeply. And uh, yeah, that's, that's an amazing piece. Uh, that's great. That's what I'm... <laughs> well, I was going to mention all of the pieces I just mentioned. <laughs> um, um, it's hard to pin down for me a single piece, but certainly uh, significant composers, uh, Stravinsky, Bartok, and Schoenberg. Uh, I would add to the specific pieces Bartok's fifth quartet and uh, Schoenberg's Perel and Yay! <laughs> well, thank you very much for staying and, and, and getting a little glimmer of, you know, light into things beside the one piece you heard tonight. So, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Yeah.